evening everyone and welcome to Greater Cambridge Shared Planning um, Area Action Plan panel session and I think this is our last panel session for the that was supporting the 10-week consultation to the North East Cambridge Area Action Plan. It's a bit of a generic session tonight, so a bit of a wrap up of issues. We've um, got a panel here for you to answer questions. For those of you who might have been to previous sessions, we've got about an hour. Um, we're going to run through a quick presentation um, and then we'll leave some time for questions at the end. And if we don't manage to get an answer today, we'll get them up on the website and we'll set you the links at the end as well. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the panel first and then what we'll do is a couple of bits of housekeeping to let you know how to proceed with questions and answers and then we'll just start the session so let me just quickly go around the screen as it is now not around the table so I'm going to go to my left first and um, to Hannah. Hi everybody my name is Hannah Loftus I'm a special project officer at the shared planning service and I've been leading on the public engagement community engagement and, and communication side of the AAP and also the local plan. Thank you Hannah. Matt? Uh, good evening everyone I'm Matthew Patterson <clears throat> I'm one of the project leads on developing the area action plan for northeast Cambridge working for the shared planning service. Cheers, Matt. Um, Terry? Good evening, everyone. I'm Terry D'Souza. I'm a Principal Planning Policy Officer at the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service, and I'm one of the team that's been involved in preparing the area action plan um, and also the evidence-based documents that underpin it. Thank you, Terry. And we've got Joe down the bottom here who's helping run the session tonight. She's leading on all of the tech wizardry that's hopefully going to be forthcoming. Um, so I didn't introduce myself. My name is Paul Freda. I'm Assistant Director for Strategy and Economy in the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service. So just to let you know, the session is being recorded tonight, so you will be able to view it. It will be both on the SCDC website and the Cambridge City website um, in the following days. Um, you can ask some questions. There's a little Q&A box down the bottom, uh, no chat function, but if you stick your questions in there, we'll answer them in the, in the uh, panel session at the end. Um, you can do that anonymously or you can choose to leave your name. Um, and for now, I think we'll just get on with the session. So I'm going to hand over to Hannah and she's going to start the presentation. Oh, she's on mute. Sorry, I'm just sharing my screen um, and I'm just going to run through a few of the kind of headline aspects of the AAP um, and as a prelude to really everyone asking some questions. Hopefully this is going to come up. So um, just a little bit about the area action plan for those of you who may be not as familiar with some of the sort of backstory here really why we're doing this consultation and what the big ideas are. Um, it is a very significant part of, of Cambridge and the area in terms of one of the major brownfield sites that we still have that's incredibly accessible to the city centre. It's uh, a 15 minute cycle ride at the minute. It already has Cambridge North Station and the guided busway and many other links. And all of that is only going to get better over the coming years. So it really is a, a strategically important site with this range of landowners that we're trying to coordinate through a planning framework. But it is also adjacent to some of the communities that have some of the biggest challenges in our area. And I think it is key for us as planners that the plan we put in place um, addresses some of those questions of deprivation and integration and really benefits those local communities in terms of housing, jobs and local services. For those of you who aren't as familiar as others with what an area or action plan actually is. So it's, it's a planning framework. It's actually a pretty important form of planning framework. It's basically equivalent in status to a local plan. Um, it sets out a spatial framework. So that is what goes where and a set of thematic policies as well. So how that stuff should be designed. What are the kind of key criteria that we will be asking uh, developments that come forward to comply with and so forth. It will be supported by a very extensive evidence base and a lot of that is already 
on our website that you can read. It supports this draft plan um, and that will be further developed over the coming months and, and years indeed. Um, and because it's a high level development plan document, it goes through a rigorous examination process with an independent planning inspector. So again, very similar to what a local plan would go through. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it needs all of this evidence base and so forth, because we really need to show that it's as well founded as it possibly could be um, on what the area's needs are and what is most sustainable and suitable. Just a little bit about how we got to this point. There have been various consultations over the years um, on the site, um, including two issues and options consultations in actual fact. Um, we've also worked very closely with community representatives, the local elected ward members, um, as well as our executive members. And of course, um, as many people will know, one of the, the key drivers here is that Central Government's Housing Infrastructure Fund has now confirmed that it would fund the relocation of the wastewater treatment plant. And that really is one of the major catalysts for significant change and regeneration in this area. Um, and that is because of the opportunity here to create new homes and jobs in a very sustainable location. So we've been consulting on this vision over the last sort of eight weeks, we've got a few more weeks to go. Um, and it's the vision that we've developed alongside all of those partners over the last couple of years. It is very much about what a 21st century low carbon city district should be like, what the mix of uses should be, how inclusive it should be for our communities, and the sustainable transport, the, the walkable, cyclable neighbourhood, very much at its heart. A few headline figures of how that breaks down in terms of the numbers. At the moment, there are 15,000 jobs in the AAP area, but only three homes. So a key driver has been to rebalance and create more homes accessible to those jobs where people don't have to commute long distances, but can walk, cycle, get bus to work themselves. So around 8,000 homes are what are proposed in the draft area action plan. Again, these are, these are our consultation proposals and we're hearing lots of comments about these at the moment. 40% of them is our target for, for affordable housing out of those 8,000 homes. We're also looking at intensifying workspace. So some of the parks, the business parks and science parks can, we feel can be intensified. And we're also looking at consolidating the industrial uses on the site as well as creating really significant public amenities, some major public parks and squares, schools, library, community facilities, and the all important connectivity that will knit Northeast Cambridge into its surroundings as seamlessly as it possibly can. Some of the key themes really, it is not just about supporting the tech in the R&D sectors, even though obviously the Science Park and St John's and so forth are within the AAP boundary. We are retaining the same amount of industrial space as is currently on the site, but in a more effective and consolidated form. This goes further in terms of the range of businesses that we want to site themselves in North East Cambridge. It's not just about the large kind of firms, it's also about startup service industries and all sorts of other sorts of business. Um, and that goes across to the housing as well. It is different sorts of housing for different kinds of people. Council and social rented, set shared ownership, key worker, build to rent, also look, talking about local, local employers housing in terms of partnering with some of those employers so that they can actually offer homes to their employees locally to themselves. self finish as well as of course conventional market sale. So it really is about a mix of uses, a mix of people and a mix of kinds of lifestyles that are enabled by development. The other really key cross-cutting theme is about walking and cycling first. The car will not be king in North East Cambridge. And I think this is a, a radical departure from many of the sort of norms, if you like, of, of development across the country, in fact, over the last 60, 70 years. Um, it is about putting walking and cycling and public transport first as a natural and obvious choice discouraging non-essential car use we will have, it's not about banning cars it's saying yes you can use a car you can get a delivery if you need it but to reduce as much as possible your need for that and really that is about air quality and well-being for everybody it's not just about the climate change agenda of course that's incredibly important but it is also on a community level the right thing to do for everybody that's affected by air pollution and and the lack of good walking and cycling connections in the area 
what goes where so there will be four centers of activity four local centers of different sorts a district center in the in the middle of the site which will be the main hub for library arts health shops and so forth uh, a local centre down by Cambridge North Station, which will supplement what's already happening there in terms of the hotel and so forth with local shops and other services. A neighbourhood centre up near St John's Business Park, and that is very much about serving the new residential areas that are planned for near there with school, local shops and so forth. And then also a local centre really on the edge of the AAP area near to King's Hedges on, on the edge of the Science Park and that is about saying actually we can bring local communities together with the Science Park workers with Cambridge Regional College, serve them all with some of the things that they really need in the area and kind of start to knit those communities together really effectively. More about that knitting in, these just show some of the key connectivity routes around the area that we're consulting on. So they're quite significant because they will really start to mitigate and overcome some of the existing barriers to movement, particularly the guided busway, Milton Road itself, of course, the A14 and also the railway line in terms of access to the green space and the cycle path along the River Cam itself. And it is designed with the, the wider public transport improvements in mind. So Cambridge Autonomous Metro and so forth, we are looking at leaving space for that. Um, and again, we are really interested to hear everybody's views on are these the right connections? Should we be doing more? Have we missed something? How can this be most effectively integrated with our existing communities? Um, and some of the green spaces that are being planned for, there's a really significant amount of green space, not only the kind of over 10 hectares of what we would call strategic green spaces, but also the mature landscapes that already exist in the Science Park and other areas, which is nearly nine hectares. Those are all going to be retained and improved. And also neighbourhood spaces, which aren't shown on this diagram because they are the smaller, kind of more localised spaces where you're going to have little pocket parks, local play spaces, and of course the streets themselves designed as places for informal socialising, recreation and other activities. So it is, a, it is a comprehensive green network which aims to link up Milton Country Park right down to, to Nuffield Road and the Guided Busway into Cheston and Fen, providing those green links all the way through to the Science Park along the first public drain as well. And addressing climate change, a really key overarching theme here and being very ambitious about what that actually means. We know we have the net zero carbon challenge by 2050. This is about saying, well, how does that shake down into real policies within the plan? So ambitious targets for non-residential buildings in terms of the BREAM standard, that's a sort of environmental standard that is kind of best practice really in the country. How do we incorporate biodiversity net gain? How do we make our buildings as naturally uh, and, and passively without using lots of environment, energy for air conditioning and so forth, passively cooled. So things like shading, thermal mass, all of the kind of passive design features, and of course water as well. We want to be as ambitious as we can be. We are limited at the moment by what we can do from, from government regulations as well, but we're really trying to push that and we'll be addressing that further as things hopefully change over the next few years as well at national level. So just a couple of notes on what happens next. We are coming towards the end of consultation, which closes on the 5th of October. So for those of you listening, please, please do get your consultation responses in before the 5th of October. We really, we've had lots in already. We want to have as many as we can, and we want to hear from as many diverse voices as possible as well. We really, really want to hear from younger people and other people in the surrounding areas, because it is about young people above all as well. We will then be undertaking some more evidence gathering and some more stakeholder engagement as we review all of those responses. And we will be reporting on how we take those responses into account at the next part of the plan making stage, which is what we call the pre-submission plan. So we will be reflecting on the responses that we receive. We will be making changes to the plan as a result of those, adapting it if necessary. And then we will be submitting that to members for their regulatory approval of, of the pre-submission plan in autumn 21. There is then a bit of a hiatus whilst the relocation process for the wastewater treatment plant goes through what's known as a development consent order DCO process. So there's a little bit of a kind of pause there before we then go into public consultation on the proposed submission plan, um, which is likely at the current timings to be in winter 2023. Following that, there will be examination 
and adoption of the plan and we'd welcome any questions that you have on that process going forward. So we thought we would just kick things off um, with a few questions that have been recently asked on social media and across other platforms um, that we know people are, are, are talking about in communities and, and wanting some answers to. So the first one is, is coming about because you know we've had the Anglian water consultation on their relocation which closed a couple of weeks ago um, and one of the questions that people have been asking is you know how did we actually decide to develop this site rather than any other site what is the kind of backstory here behind deciding to move Anglian waters plant um, and release essentially this site for development um, so I'm going to hand over to Terry who's going to I think answer on this question before we move on Thank you, Hannah. So yeah, so essentially the um, work on the area action plan has been ongoing for quite some time now. So um, for those of you that can remember, we originally consulted on this uh, on this area in 2014, and that was an early issues and options document where we asked a whole range of questions about, you know, what could we do around around the wastewater treatment works if, if we were to develop this area. So at the time, um, there was no funding in place there was no there was no kind of possibility that the wastewater treatment would actually be moving so it was about well what could you do around the periphery of that site and it was purely around the land to the east of milton road so it was between the railway line and milton road um and there were a few options in there in terms of you know could you put in more office floor space could you put in more industrial but residential was really limited to the, to the real southern part of the site especially around nuffield road purely because of you know the odor and things like that that come from the sewage treatment works so um, there was a few options that went out there and then obviously we went out for consultation and the council um, sort of took, took all of those reps on board as we started to think about what next for the site. Now, before we then went to consultation again in 2019, there were a few things that actually happened on the ground. So the Cambridge, uh, Cambridge North train station was built, um, the extension to the guided busway, which then served the train station was also put in place. So suddenly things started to happen in the area, um, which improved the site's connectivity to, to the wider area. Um, and then last year, between February and March, we went out for consultation on issues and options too. Now that looked at a much more comprehensive development of the area. So that was not only land to the east of Milton Road, but it also included the wastewater treatment works, if that was to go, and also um, Cambridge Science Park as well. Um, and that was to really try and bring in, you know, the development aspirations of the science park and actually how we can tie, try and link all of the development together uh, and particularly think about um, transport and the trip budget and that kind of thing in a much more uh, comprehensive way rather than just thinking about it as one side of Milton Road compared to the other side of Milton Road. Whilst we're actually out for consultation on the issues and options in 2019, um, the government announced that um, the, um, the HIF funding, the Housing Infrastructure Fund for the Wastewater Treatment Works had been successful in, in that first, first tranche of, of funding. Um, and so that kind of gave the council um, sort of, you know, kind of further uh, encouragement to continue with the consultation that we were undertaking and to develop the plan. Um, so that kind of brings us to where we are now. So, you know, where, where we are now is we are consulting on the draft plan. So rather than issues and options, you know, here's a whole, whole series of questions and, you know, what are the potential options? The draft plan now sets out what we think is the most appropriate use of the site um, and how we can best redevelop the area and really optimise um, the area as much as possible. If the DCO process that Hannah was talking about a moment ago is successful and the wastewater treatment plant is relocated elsewhere, then essentially what we need to make sure is that there is a planning framework in place. Um, otherwise, there is a real risk that development in this area will just happen in a real piecemeal way. You won't, you won't deliver the infrastructure that is necessary and it will be um, well, it, it just it just won't be delivered in the way in the way that it could be, and it really won't optimise um, you know the, the benefits of this area. Um, so so really, we, what we're trying to do is make sure there is that framework in place. Now, obviously, if the DCO process isn't successful for whatever reason and it doesn't happen, or the government decides that they're no longer going to do the HIP funding, then obviously we as a council need to revisit the area action plan. But at the moment, you know everything is you know we're working towards um, you know that that's going to uh, going to be successful. There's also a couple of other things as well, is that, is that we've also got some infrastructure improvements that are coming in. So the CAM, the Chisholm Trail, the Milton Road cycling project, as well as the Water Beach Broomway. So again, as I've mentioned in previous webinars, this is really about North East Cambridge um, integrating with the local area and actually being that, that missing piece of the jigsaw with a number of these different projects that are happening elsewhere and trying to bring everything together. 
hopefully that answers the question, Anna. Thank you, Terry. That's brilliant. Um, another thing we have been hearing a lot of people asking about is the green space strategy here. And there's been some talk about are there enough green spaces being planned for? What kind are there? Um, why aren't they bigger? Or, you know, what's going on with the sort of number side of things? And I'm afraid we're probably going to be back to Terry because Terry's definitely an expert on this stuff. But Terry, I wonder if you could just unpack a little bit more. I sort of gave a few headline figures earlier, but talk a little bit more about why the strategy is the way it is. Sure, yeah, okay. Um, I'm not sure I'm, I'm the expert, but I'll try. Uh, so, so there were basically. <laughs> There are basically four levels of, of uh, open space, uh, if you think about it like that. So first of all, you have the strategic open space. And these are, these are the, the green spaces that were shown on the diagram that Hannah showed in the presentation. So that's the linear part that stretches all the way from Nuffield Road all the way through the site under and under the A14 into Lilton Country Park. To give you a kind of a sense of scale, that's about a kilometre in length from, from the bottom of the site to the top of the site. It also picks up things like the Green High Street um, and um, and the Cowley Road Triangle, which is another green space that we're proposing. Um, you've also got some of the existing open spaces on the site as well. So if you think about Cambridge Science Park, they have an incredible landscape that runs through the middle of that site. Most people wouldn't really know it unless you actually worked there because it, uh, you know, the site is very difficult to penetrate at the moment, but it is um, you know, part of that open space network um, that we really wanna try and build on the existing and then try and get that to, to integrate uh, with, the new, with any new development that comes forward. You then have the next level of open space down, which is the kind of the neighbourhood spaces. Now, the neighbourhood spaces aren't shown on any of the diagrams, but effectively, with each, within each of the development blocks within North East Cambridge that we're showing on our plans, a planning application would come forward for those areas, and those applications would need to provide not only buildings, but public realm, so the kind of the streets, and also the, um, the green spaces that would be within those. So those are the kind of neighbourhood spaces that are kind of your... Think about your door, your doorstep green spaces. So you know those are the ones that are kind of normally five minutes from your front door, um, and they provide you know kind of space for people to sit, relax, and space for you know young children to you know go on a swing or, or you know burn off some energy. Um, and then you've got the communal spaces. Now the communal spaces are are those that are, are private to, to residents, but they would be um, kind of ground floor kind of internal courtyards, um, podium terraces, or even roof terraces as well. Um, that, you know, um, so, you know, they, they can provide, again, uh, amenity to people on their doorsteps, but again, not shown on any of the plans because we're not developing the planning applications itself. We're just setting the high level framework. And then really importantly, you have the private spaces. Now, for the majority of new homes in North East Cambridge, they will be flatted developments. Um, and so we would be expecting balconies on, on, on those properties. Um, and we've set standards, actually, about in terms of the sizes that they should be because what you get with a lot of uh, new development where there aren't standards, you end up getting balconies that are really weird shaped, they're, or they're really undersized, and they're not even big enough for a table and chair and for somebody to walk around them. So we're making sure that we're, we're, we're providing that, that sort of level of, of rigor within the plan in terms of the standards. Um, one of the other things that is really hard to get across, um, uh, but I think Hannah's managed, Hannah and the team have managed it quite well in some of the diagrams is that we, we need to kind of reimagine what the streets would be because in terms of the distance, the, the space between buildings, you know, as Hannah said, this isn't going to be a place where you're going to be able to park your car outside your front door. Um, cars are going to be, apart from disabled parking and access, cars will be parked off site in, in, a, in a car barn away from your front door. So the street, there's so much more opportunity within the street for kind of amenity space, informal play for people to socialize and interact with each other. Um, and so we need to try and reimagine what streets kind of once were um, before, before cars sort of overtook um, and, and sort of dominated all of our streets. So that's something that we we're really, really trying um, to, to do in, in North East Cambridge. And, and the, you know, this, is, this happens in, in Bedstead down in South London and is really popular on the continent as well. So it, it can be done at this scale. Um, so, you know, we're just a, a trying to apply it to a local context. Um, and then the final thing that we're trying to do is make sure that we're increasing access to green spaces elsewhere. So, you know, uh, an underpass into Milton Country Park, um, a, a bridge over into Chesterton Fen and the River Corridor. So this isn't just about improving accessibility to people that live uh, with, will live within a new development, but it's also people that live in the surrounding areas as well. Talking to somebody at Nuns Way Pavilion a couple of weeks ago saying, wouldn't it be great if I could go from Nuns Way Pavilion through the area action plan area into Milton Country Park without having to go on a main road? It's like, well, that would actually be possible if, if the area action plan is built out the way that we're hoping it will be. 
Um, so, so that's one of the things that we were trying to do as well. To try and get your head around some of the images of kind of what this might look like. Um, if you have a look at the typology study, which is online, um, we can share the link to that. But also we did a webinar a few weeks ago on biodiversity and open space. And there's some really good images and precedent examples from other places within the, within the presentation of that. It's kind of the sort of the first 10, 15 minutes into that. So I would highly recommend looking at that if you're interested in this, this topic area. Thanks, Terry. And another thing that a lot of people have been asking us is about COVID-19 and how this plan responds to some of the things that have become more important to people over the last few months. And I think it's a, it's a really good question and it's a really interesting one that I think planners all over the country and indeed all over Europe and, and, and really you know, the whole world are asking ourselves at the moment. Um, Matt, do you want to just pick up on this a little bit? Yeah, certainly. And when we started drafting this plan, obviously it was in much different circumstances. We weren't dealing with a, a, a global pandemic at that point in time. Um, and so really the plan at this point in time doesn't really address uh, COVID-19 issues. What we put at the beginning of the plan is that we will have a watching brief really, uh, mainly because we didn't really know either at that point whether we'd be living with COVID uh, for the next couple of months or, or for the longer period as well. All indications from um, the government's chief uh, health advisors tends to be that, that COVID is something we're going to have to live with from, from now on. Um, so we are looking obviously at what the implications of that are. We're talking with our partners um, in terms of uh, the science park and business parks to understand what the implications of that are for new employment floor space, for the existing employment floor space as well, how many um, you know, workers they expect to have on the site, uh, what those workers need by way of amenity. Um, we're also talking with others around, well, what type of um, provision in terms of housing do you need? Do we need to increase the the size of the housing to ensure that actually you've got sufficient space for home working, because all of us understand the pressures that, that that's placed on, you know, um, on the kitchen table or wherever else, the dining room table, wherever people have had to work and um, especially sharing that with the kids with home learning. So, and we understand obviously all of us, the importance of um, uh, good Wi-Fi connections, good broadband, um, how essential that is to, to maintaining our communication and our links and we'll need to ensure that that you know full fiber to the to the premises is included and in all the new developments coming forward um, but it plays through right through to um, what type of community facilities you provide and the open space you provide in terms of community facilities um, you know do you have the normal libraries and community centers uh, are we able to use them in the way that we have in the past or, or do we need to think of new provision and, and uses for those spaces as well and, and ensure that we maximise people's access to, to essential amenities and facilities. And in regard to open space, uh, I think it's more and more not around quantums, but about what we need for people's mental health and wellbeing. Um, and, we think that Northeast Cambridge is really well placed in that regard in terms of us promoting a, a very walkable, cyclable neighborhood where you have all your local amenities within easy walking distance of your house, um, great access to potential jobs in the future, but also those strategic cycle and walking connections so that you are still not missing out should you wish to travel a little bit further or need to travel further to, to access um, further amenities that are surrounding us. So um, in that regard, I think we're on the right path and certainly the move away from um, vehicular traffic and things like that to more sustainable modes and a more compact neighborhood sort of fits with that agenda moving forward. So, but at the moment we have a watching brief, we'll need to um, monitor, talk with our partners, talk with everyone moving forward, understand what, what the implications are and we'll need to adapt the plan. And we might not get it right originally and we'll still keep amending and, and varying it depending on what comes up. Thanks, Matt. And I think it's, it's worth saying that there is a wider discussion here also around the local plan. We're having very similar discussions on the 
more uh, larger scale across Greater Cambridge. Um, we have a lot of evidence-based studies that are in play for that as well. Um, those are going to be reviewed because at the moment we just don't have the data yet to tell us very firmly what COVID is going to have in terms of the economic impact and so forth. So the plan with the local plan is also that we're going to be reviewing some of that information in light of COVID and the early the uh, months of next year. Um, we'll be also sharing that with our elected members, looking at what they like to do strategically and so forth as well. So all of that will play into the area action plan. We very much are one team developing the area action plan together with the local plan, crossing those issues across um, and do watch this space because I'm sure we'll be having lots more discussions about this and bringing you as our communities in on that as well over the coming months for sure. Anna, can I come in as well? Actually, it's um, it's a really interesting one because obviously this stuff is is so live. But I think you know our job as plan makers is to try and provide some certainty within you know really uncertain you know you know landscape. And I think probably arguably two two thousand and twenty is probably the least certain time you could be working doing this. And I think that you know all of the conversations you know that we're all having now are about around this stuff you know so it's it's incredibly challenging but it's also you know it also is why we do this this piece of work and why Hannah's saying you know we need to bring it all together and provide certainty where we can but flexibility where it's needed and you know I think you know from the northeast Cambridge perspective I think the vision and is still strong and it still sits there and says you know we can do what needs to be done irrespective of what you know, the, the granularity needs to be in the future of, you know, having to manage COVID, having to manage the impact of, you know, potentially economic issues around COVID and Brexit. So, you know, we are constantly thinking, constantly responding, you know, government consultation for the white paper is out at the moment as well, which is another piece that's going to affect our view on plan making and planning in general and place. So, you know, we are trying to keep, a, you know, keep as much as we can an open mind but give some security where we can to ensure that you know we can provide development and places which are going to be fit for the fit for the future and fit for you know future generations to live in and work in thanks paul yeah i'm just seeing um a few questions starting to come in on the q a and do add more if you have them there's a really good question actually looking to the the near future rather than the far future which is what is the situation with current developer applications before the AAP is adopted? For example, the Chesterton partnership is expanding the area around Cambridge North and St John's have a new application underway, which includes some terrible cycling and walking facilities. Are there any restrictions on current developments if they fail to integrate with the proposed new AAP framework? Matt, I wonder if you're probably well placed to talk about this because um, you're yeah. involved in much of that negotiation. Yeah, well, unfortunately, uh, we cannot prevent new well from developers from submitting planning applications before we've uh, finalised the um, AAP, if you like, um, and um, we're a number of years away because we're awaiting on the outcome of the development consent order, as you said. Um, so any new development that comes forward, the Air Reaction Plan, because it's only in draft, it's at a, what's called Regulation 18 stage at this point in time. It's a material consideration, but it has very limited weight, really. Um, the Any application that comes forward would need to be determined against the um, uh, current local plan policies, um, and they're not that specific and and they don't really provide for the types of development that we would like to see through the AAP which is why we're preparing it um, but they also don't don't deal with um, things like how you ensure that actually any of these developments can can mitigate their transport impacts through a shared collaborative approach across the area or, or how they'll manage um, the strategic connections that we require the AAP to deliver and, and give confidence to members who, uh, who ultimately approve the planning applications that the things that we want to see as a community and as a council can actually be delivered, um, not in a piecemeal way, as Terry said, by individual schemes coming forward in isolation, but as a joint piece of work, which the AAP provides the framework for. So it's going to be very difficult. Like I said, we can't stop um, developers bringing forward planning applications at this stage. My alarm's just gone off. Um, we need to 
the wife's cooking, sorry. Um, we can't prevent them. We have to determine their applications. We have been working with them. We would hope that, um, that the proposals that they bring forward are aligned with the area action plan. However, um, what we're, our aspiration has always been is that um, that we it, that the future of this area, which is really important to Cambridge, shouldn't be developer-led really in terms of its future outcomes and vision, but should be plan-led, which is you know a shared vision for the space, for the place, um, which is a vision from the councils, the community, the landowners, and everyone else, and that um, you know. It's an area that uh, benefits all, really. So, um, yeah, I think that I'll leave it there. Well, we we do have some some guidance that we have been putting out, some interim guidance for developers who are coming forward with applications about how they should refer to the evidence base that we've been developing, because that evidence base is very significant. For instance, around things like transport. So we are expecting just those those applications to show that they have taken heed and, and been mindful of that evidence base and i think it's also worth reminding everybody that you know you are all community members too and you you know many of you um who, who are watching or may watch this back as well when you it's on youtube have been involved in the different consultations and in sharing your views to this consultation you are more than welcome to also share your views on the applications that may come forward over the coming years as well and comment on them and comment on what you'd like to see um, that you know what you think of their proposals that is the, the point of the planning process it does operate at many levels not just at the plan making but also at that development management stage where there is the opportunity for everybody in the community to give their comments on those applications in the future hope that I think that's a really good point Hannah and, and, and um, you know one I'd, I'd reiterate really yeah we're trying to we'll try and make some of that available as soon as we know when things are happening I think you know the other important thing to mention is that you know we are a collaborative planning service as well and we do like you know we want to talk to our partners and stakeholders and ensure that you know we don't have to you know butt up against a brick wall when we're talking about these things it's about trying to think about you know what is the best outcome in a systems way rather than saying oh no we're not going to do this so you know it's important for us to keep uh, the, those developers and the landowners you know fully briefed on what we're doing and make them understand the wider vision for that place and you know I think you know communication is a, is a key part of that too as well. And fundamentally, yeah. sorry. Just to add as well I mean it, it is fantastic for the AAP that you've got significant developer interest in the place to, to deliver on the aspiration that we want to see. Um, you know often we prepare plans for which you know they sit on the shelves, unfortunately, because we haven't got that kind of land interest in, in bringing things forward, or it takes a, a significant amount of time. So, you know, you've got to look at it both ways as well. One thing is, you know, whether it's at the development um, individual application stage or the plan making stage, all applications need to be proving that they're sustainable and sustainable development is ultimately what the area action plan is all about so you know the, these things should be coming together and i think it, we will as a planning authority obviously determine according to existing plans and policies but also according to the nppf and some of those much bigger more overarching themes around climate and, and sustainability i'm just going to move on to another question that's been asked recently and and i know that there's been a little bit of confusion about this um, in across sort of the, the social media and, and online and so forth over the last few days, which is just around the question of, of density in North East Cambridge. And there's questions being asked about a, an article that was written by someone else, not by us, um, which was saying that North East Cambridge was going to be denser than inner London in terms of people. I thought it would be just a useful opportunity here to just unpack that a little bit. We didn't really recognise the, the numbers that were actually in that article, um, but the Greater London Authority did some really interesting work on density a few years ago, and there's a study online which we're going to put in the FAQ so that you guys could read that, um, which showed that inner London, which is about 10 boroughs, actually it kind of goes all the way from Greenwich through to Kensington and Chelsea, Camden, Lewisham, all over the place, has a population density of about 108 people per hectare. Interestingly, Paris has a population density of twice that, of over 200 people per hectare, which just goes to show that all of those little terraced houses in London, there really are a lot of them, and a lot of them are only two or three stories high. 
Um, but actually, Northeast Cambridge, if you look at the population that we're projecting, is actually around that 99, 100 people per hectare over the area. So it's actually not that dissimilar from, from the kind of large area of inner London in terms of the statistics. And we are looking at similar densities in terms of the residential typologies to some of areas like, you know, kind of classic areas like Notting Hill, parts of Islington, where you've got maybe four, five, six storey terraced houses in quite dense arrangements. But they do have that amazing sense of place. And I think, you know, we just want to make sure that some of those density arguments are put in perspective. Terry mentioned some of the uh, AAP things that we had um with the other webinars that we've had over the last few weeks and we had one on density and built form so if you're interested in learning a bit more about that um i do feel like the tv anchor plugging the uh, plugging the previous episodes of my uh, show or my podcast but do go and have a look at the density and built form one because we do unpack what that might look like how that might feel and also some of the examples that we've been drawing on we have looked at best practice from London, from other parts of Cambridge, from other parts of the country and indeed from abroad. But that, that sort of, you know, really wonderful density that you do get in many European cities where the public realm is really generous um, is really something I think we're aiming for here. Just moving on to another question um, about the planning white paper. And this is something that has come up a lot as well since the government published this a few weeks ago, which is their proposals for planning reform. Um, it is just a consultation paper from government at the moment. So it definitely is not a legislation or a new requirement on us, but obviously we're tracking it very carefully. Um, Paul, I know you've been looking at this quite a lot. Um, maybe do you want to kick off with a little bit about the planning white paper and how as a service we're dealing with this? And, and Matt could talk a little bit about some of the specific question here, which is about dividing land into growth, renewal and protection areas, which is what is proposed in that. Thanks, Hannah. I was going to say I have no idea what you're talking about, but um, that me. but um, yeah. So I think you know, obviously, we have had a lot of, of questions around you know what are we going to do about the planning white paper. I think we've got to be realistic that it came out you know a month ago. We have taken some time in digesting it ourselves. I mean, there are two consultations. There's a slightly different consultation which is um, around some some interim changes to the planning system, and then there is the white paper which does propose some quite radical changes and it's got some quite radical gaps in it too so you know it isn't legislation at the moment and actually to to to, to deliver the, the you know any of the content within the planning white paper there will be have to be some 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 pretty um radical changes to primary legislation notwithstanding that you know we have to keep an eye on that because you know we are through you know, the next few years and a long journey of plan making as not just with the uh, Northeast Cambridge AAP, but actually with the local plan itself. So, you know, we are likely to see some of those changes come into fruition. I think the important thing is that, you know, irrespective of the mechanisms and functions that, you know, the evidence bases and all of the other work that we're doing is, is critical and fundamental. And some of the themes, you know, within some of the changes mentioned around climate change, around digital, you know, uh, are themes that we are, you know, we are thinking that we're, you know, we're reasonably well, you know, at the front of, of dealing with. So, you know, there are some positives in there too. So I just think it's our answers. We're going back to government pretty soon. We're going to be making our comments back to them as a planning authority. Um, you know, it's an open consultation, so you know anyone can make a response back to it. So if you're watching this, you know, and you've got views on it yourself, make a response back. Um, I'm told, I'm told uh, that it's not a closed, not it's not a closed door yet, and so you know we should be making these responses back. I mean, if you're interested in our response, I think the uh, closing date is the 29th of um, October, um, and we'll be putting our formal response back in, which is going to go through the relevant council committees over the next month. Um, and then we'll make that response available on the website so you can see what our thoughts are on the matter, but um, and how they might relate to some of the work that we're doing. Does so anyone Matt, else have got anything on that as well? Because it's probably quite an interesting yeah. subject. Well, Matt, on the specific question in the chat here, would this mean our, the local plan or maybe the AAP needs to be more specific than it has in the past? What is your view on how that could? affect the AAP? Yeah, so I think it would. Um, it, it, I think it's tongue-in-cheek to call it a zoning system, zone-based planning system when you're only talking about three zones really. Um, 
it's it's not it's a very blunt tool really um so um but yeah i think i can quite easily see that it would require significant uh changes to how you write local plans um for the aap in particular uh, probably a lot more detail a lot more of us spelling out exactly what it is what we want where and where rather than leaving the the detail flexibility if you like to developers uh, it would be for us to essentially write a master plan for the whole area um, do parameters plans around that as well um, specify exactly the quantums and, and types of land use we would want to see provided um, however it's it, it then leaves it very much to the marketplace after that um, the white paper does it, it seems to suggest that developers can then pick and choose which parts of that they want to deliver upon in terms of the list of land use you put in there um, it's really unclear how you'll do infrastructure planning in a meaningful way um, how you'll secure the funding how you'll deliver on the aspirations for affordable housing there's lots of unknowns within that um, but essentially we'd be writing an outline planning permission as part of our, our uh, evidence base and as part of our development plan document so yeah it has significant implications for us and the AAP is about 50% of the way towards doing an outline planning permission but we'd need to take it that extra 50% with a lot more detail I can probably yeah. tell from his accent Matt has experience of the planning system. <laughs> right a, a very much a zoned planning system as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and and you know a, a proper planning a zone planning system re requires a lot of detail in the planning to enable that to to provide for permitted development essentially at the end of the day that that enables people to bring forward a planning application but to to give everyone the certainty that what can come forward is what you meant to come forward on that site and and you can't get something that was unexpected really um you know and that's the level of detail you require you really do require that that level of information yeah and i think that one of the other things really that you know is absolutely critical not just to the suggestions within the white paper or the, not the suggestions as they may be is the transition period for whatever happens going forward between a system that we currently operate to a system that may well come forward and you know so until we know those things and have any idea about how that might work I think it's just so premature to even be thinking about how you could or could not you know and what implication that may well have on you know specific places specific things and you know specific ways of going forward so yeah um, it's uh, certainly it's an interesting time say so yeah my main concern with it all is just how much public consultation you can do within that you know they've set out this very short process for yeah. doing local plans and there isn't really the amount of community engagement facilitation and and that i would anticipate that people would want mm. to have in a plan that essentially gives developers planning permission at the end of the day so I think it would be really interesting to see what comments are coming in on that. Um, you know, the the white paper has said, hasn't it, that we want community engagement to be at the heart. But as you say, there may be some questions about the timescales on that and whether that is achievable. And you're all very welcome to comment on that to the government if you wish to, because uh, there's definitely a balance to be struck between speed of plan making and local engagement, um, you know. I've got just a quick question um, that I wanted to bring in Terry here because this is another one that's been asked quite a lot recently as well. Um, just about parking, Terry, and are, are we banning cars? I know we've sort of tried to cover that a little bit in the presentation, but there seems to be a perception out there that we're essentially banning cars um, or, and therefore that's going to cause issues like antisocial parking, displacement parking elsewhere, that kind of thing. Could you just kind of clear up some of the misunderstandings on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, throughout the years, I've, I've noticed that nothing gets people worked up in planning policy more oh, yeah. than kind of parking and congestion and traffic. So yeah, it's a really good question. Um, hopefully, the presentation sort of made it clear that no, we're not banning cars uh, for North East Cambridge, but we are trying to, um, you know, think about um, how people move in in a very different way. So really building on what's already at the site in terms of uh, public transport and also all of the planned 
projects and schemes that are already coming forward. So we'll speak to are we losing theory? There's so much happening in that area in terms of sustainable trans. So as part of that process, uh, we're looking at introducing a trip budget for the site. Now that's something that's quite unusual for a, for a plan like this. Oh, can you still hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'll t I'm going to turn my video off because, um, yeah, it says that my internet's unstable. Um, so yeah, so so we're yeah, so we're looking at um, a trip budget for the area. It's quite unusual. Normally, you would do kind of um, predict and provide. So you would say well, it's going to generate this number of cars. How many more lanes can we add, or how many more junction improvements can we do? Well, actually, in this sense, what we're saying is these are the number of uh, of trips that you're allowed into the area at peak time. Um, and that will allow development to come forward. But beyond that, then that's kind of the limit. You know, beyond that, you're going to create significant congestion and, and issues. And that's just going to cause local air quality problems. And it's going to back up onto the A14, which is part of the Highways England network. So, um, so you know, what we're doing is doing something sort of a, bit, a bit out there, a little bit different compared to what most plans would do. Um, and, and, and that's what the trip budget is. In terms of about the site itself you know we aren't one way that we're trying to get people to think differently is not put their cars outside their living rooms what we're saying is if you live at northeast cambridge you know there'll be a reduced parking uh, on site for people that live and work there and actually those car parking spaces will be in what we're calling car barns so they're kind of like multi-story car parks that could be combined with other uses now it, given the option, if you knew that your car was five minutes away and that the local shop was five minutes away, you wouldn't go and walk to your car to then drive to another shop. The mindset would be, you're a five minute walk away from the shop, I'll just walk to the shop. So that's, that's essentially what we're trying, what we're really trying to do, really thinking about these 15 minute neighbourhoods um, that, you know, you've, you've got day to day needs, local facilities, local services, kind of, you know, within a very short walk of your front door. There is the possibility that it could result in things like antisocial parking and also parking displacement elsewhere. And that's something that we're really, really keen to make sure it doesn't happen. You know, we've learned a lot of lessons and we're continuing to learn a lot of lessons about development that's happened elsewhere around the city. Uh, so thinking about developments down in Trumpington um, and just making sure that we're working with partners such as the County Council and others to make sure that we are monitoring and managing parking as, as development takes place. North East Cambridge is going to take well over sort of, you know, 15, 20 years to, to be built out. So there's going to be lots of opportunities to, to really make sure that we are on top of this over, uh, over a long period. It's not like we're going to get 20,000 new jobs and 8,000 homes overnight. This is going to take a long time and gives us plenty of opportunity to reflect and consider that as we move forward. The trip budget also thinks about deliveries as well. Yeah just from the whole COVID thing, you really start to realise, I'm sure everyone's in a similar boat, how many online orders turn up on, on people's streets every single day now. Um, and so what we're trying to do is really think about how to coordinate um, deliveries. So kind of logistics hubs, and then they can, um, you can do kind of last green mile deliveries, um, like, like you do in Central Cambridge already. So yeah, so not banning the car. Um, and hopefully you managed to hear all of that despite the same unstable. Thanks, Harry. Yeah. This is super helpful. And the thing, it you know, a, then, oh, sorry. Sorry. It, it is about designing the place, though, isn't it? So that it is essentially, you, we're starting from scratch at parts of northeast Cambridge, and it's about designing it to be low car or, or to be cycle and pedestrian friendly and prioritised in the first instance and pushing the cars to the fringe. But yeah. Yeah. I wonder if I can just quickly mention to everyone, we've got about five minutes left, I think, and, and I just had a, a note thing to say that obviously we haven't got any more questions from you live at the moment. If you're worried and you, you know about asking a question, you can post anonymously. We've got still got five minutes left or so, so you can still post. We can have do a few more of the FAQs from previous sessions. But um, if you're feeling brave and stick an, another question up on there, I know there's not very many of you tonight, but um, you can stick it anonymously. We won't read it out. And Joe's obviously just shared um, where you can get more information. Um, we really, really do want um, as many responses as we can get. And, and as I said, you can, you can comment online via our website. There's an email address if you've got any problems with that or any questions. Um, we can also still send you out leaflets and we can send out paper copies of things if that's your preferred method or if that works for your friends, your neighbours, your family and so forth who might not be so digitally literate. 
Um, and, you know, we hope that some of the material that we've been putting out on YouTube and, and on social media and so forth has been helpful. We really, rec we really like some feedback on all of that as well. Um, we've been trying a lot of new things, both because we have to, because it's COVID, but also because it's the right thing to do. And we've learned from the local plan consultation last time around, um, where we did, you know, definitely a lot more digital than we had previously. And, and I think it really did pay off in terms of the range of responses, the types of people we got involved with that. So, you know, we've got a few weeks left. Please do spread the word. I know everyone's really busy, um, but the more people we can have telling us what we think and that that is both what you don't agree with, but also I think the bits that you do agree with, you know, if there's something that you really don't want to be lost out of the plan, unless you tell us that it's really important to you and that, you don't, you know, it's really important, whether it's a connectivity link or whether it's a certain green aspiration, we need to hear the things you support as well, because otherwise there's always a danger that someone is going to come in and say, I don't like it. And, you know, that might end up getting watered down. So, so please do comment back on that as, as, um, as strongly as you possibly can. Thank you so much. OK, well, we've got a couple more, more, more um, minutes left. And, you know, I think we're just maybe just worth just t telling you that there are the other webinars available online just on that transport one that Terry was talking about, we actually did unpack a bit more of that and showed some images and some of the Woan Earth streets, which are the kind of Dutch streets that are very much in a way the model for what we're looking for here, how people actually manage to make streets that do feel really wonderful. They don't ban the car, but they are definitely places where your, your five-year-old, your six-year-old feels happy cycling around, playing with their friends and so forth. So do check out some of them. Um, Joe's also put up the FAQs. Um, we put up a lot of other questions from some of the other chats there and so forth. Um, and finally, I think just because it is the last of our, our sessions here, just to say thank you to everybody who's been involved. It's been really, really great. We've had some really fantastic attendance through the whole series. Um, we're all now feeling like we're, we're Paul and I have been, I think we've been on about 10 webinars in the last week. We've just done so many across this and the local plan, but it has been just really amazing. We had about 100 people earlier on talking about the local plan. So, you know, we hope it's been effective for all of you. Thanks to everyone who's listened in. Thanks for everyone who's also sending in comments. We've seen hundreds of comments coming into the inbox so far. So we're looking forward to reading them all. Um, and yeah, I don't know, Paul, if there's anything else I've, I've missed there. Yeah, no, I think I just agree, really. I mean, you know, it's been a bit of a brave new world for us. I mean, running this consultation, this started sort of in July and, you know, we were really wondering how it was going to go in this kind of, in this format, but it has been really good. Like I said, we've had lots and lots of comments through this, the, the, the board view, it's been positive. Um, I think that, you know, it's something we're definitely going to keep, um, even if it's not around formal consultations. As we said, Hannah said, we've just done a couple of webinars on the local plan. And um, that's not in a consultation period at the moment. We're just doing some, you know, some panel sessions on frequently asked questions. It's helpful for us to get an understanding of the questions you're asking and be able to answer them up front or at least put them on our website as well. Because if you've asked the question, no doubt, you know, 100 other people have got that, you know, that same question. And I think it's really important for us to be able to see that stuff. Um, as Hannah said, go to the website. All of the recorded sessions from the North East Cambridge session are there. There are some specific you know, topics as well. So there's stuff around housing, green spaces, design and density. As, you know, so you, if you know, you can sort of unpack some of those topics in a little more detail. You know, the chances are we'll be running a few more of these over the next few yeah. months in relation to both you know, what we're doing here and also some of the, you know, the, the government consultation. We might even do a session on that, God forbid. Um, and then, you know, I think that, you know, we'll, you know, we'll try and keep this going on. And the dialogue is great. So, you know, thank you all for making this easy for us. I wish I could see you all, um, uh, you know, as much as I love seeing my colleagues, it's only my colleagues I can currently see. So, and, you know, other than that, I think thanks to the team, thanks to the panel, thanks to everybody who's put this consultation together. Um, it's got another two weeks left to run, get your comments in, um, get to the website. And other than that, have a lovely Monday evening and have a great week, everybody. Thanks, all. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. See you. Bye.